There we go. So hi, my name is Abigail Jerusik, and what's your name? My name is Dan Ying. All right, and currently it is uh, May 20th, 2020 at 3.34 p.m. As of right now, there are 1.57 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States, mm -hmm. where 300,000 people have recovered and 93,111 deaths. And where our interviewee is from, Wisconsin, there are 12,885 confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 467 deaths. All right, so getting started, uh, would you be willing to share your demographic information for the study? Absolutely. Um, the specific demographics that I understand that you're looking for is that I am uh, male, I'm cisgendered, I uh, am 36 years old, I uh, was born and raised in uh, Wisconsin. Okay. And what are the primary things you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, professionally, I serve as the director of the Office of Multicultural Affairs, and uh, I'm, I've been in that particular role for about two years now. And in that particular role, specifically what I do is I work with a team of staff members who provide student services that's very specific and unique for students of color on campus. And in addition to on-campus services, uh, specifically for students of color, we also provide services for campus climate-related initiatives. And that includes any sort of programming and uh, speaker series or educational components for all faculty, all staff, and all students. And it's widely open too as well. So there are two, uh, two very unique and, and discernible functions that we do, one for the students of color specifically and one for the entire campus. And so on top of that, uh, a lot of it is strategic planning and identifying like, what the priorities are, how to utilize our resources to make the biggest impact and meet the needs of our students, as well as uh, meeting the needs of the campus climate too as well, making sure that regardless of where our students go, that um, they will feel welcome, that uh, there are equitable practices happening uh, everywhere, not just in the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so when you first learned about COVID-19, what were your thoughts about it? Um, when, I, when I first heard about COVID-19, there wasn't a lot of information um, other than the information that's coming from overseas. Uh, reading information in articles from the BCC um, and seeing their articles about uh, the different um, experiences that's, that people were having. Uh, and so it, I, it, it really felt distant. It didn't feel like something that I had to worry too much about. I kept a close eye on it because uh, understanding how global issues impact uh, higher education and how it impacts our students really matters. So I knew that a large number of our international students came from China, uh, as well as Malaysia and from the Asian countries. And so I was, uh, you know, that perked up my ears, perked up my interest. And so I was paying relatively close attention at that particular point once I knew it was from China. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I understood how that might impact our Chinese international students. And that was my first approach and my first uh, the first way in which I was looking at that, that news and that information on the global level. So how has, like, uh, once, like, start, like, uh, they start closing down uh, mm -hmm. campus, uh, what was that like for the uh, students who are from abroad, from Asia? Mm -hmm. like, um, um, I, I think I understand what, que what your, your question is. You know, it, it, it's uh, my understanding of the experience of the international students, specifically the Chinese and Malaysian students. Right. Um, you know, I, I've had an opportunity, uh, I've been very fortunate to be very close uh, with a number of international students um, and working in partnership with the Center for National Education has been an important uh, priority of mine over the last year. Um, and so uh, working really closely with some of the students, what I found is that many of the international students decided to stay here. Uh, there was a small group uh, of students that I know of that went back to as well. And off the top of my head, I don't remember how many total international students went back to their home countries and how many total international students stayed home or stayed here in the U.S. Uh, those who stayed in the U.S. primarily stayed on campus in their dorms. Uh, and, uh, and either that or they stayed in the United States in their residence off campus. Uh, and those who went home just simply went back home. Um, I remember talking to a student who uh, went back to um, South Korea, and that particular student had articulated that you know when they went back, they had they themselves had to uh, undergo a 14-day uh, self quarantine too. Uh, and so I think that that was happening across across the globe. Anytime that any sort of international travel was happening, regardless of where you came from, they were asking those travelers.
those to um, self quarantine for at least 14 days to ensure that they weren't asymptomatic. And, uh, and, and so I know that some of those students had to do that. And, uh, you know, they were, they were fine. And I think that they were really happy to just be around family, have a group around familiar people. Um, the one thing that uh, some of the international students told me that, you know, regardless of whether they went back to their home countries or not, they still had to do their homework and they still had to engage in some kind of group projects too as well. And so having the differences in time zones really kind of made it a, a little challenging. Um, and so, you know, they had to work with their respective instructors to figure out what it looked like, you know, how they would continue to interact, uh, the responsibilities that they had. Um, and just trying to figure out those logistics uh, so that there wasn't too much interruption. Uh, and admittedly, I think that at first, everyone experienced interruptions. Um, you know, our domestic students experienced interruptions in technology. Our international students, um, you know, had some interruption in technology too as well. And understanding how to use a new system, especially if they didn't have to worry about Canvas uh, in, in um, for their classes, or did, they didn't have to worry about uh, utilizing uh, Collaborate Ultra. Uh, through Canvas as a synchronous classroom. And they didn't have to, uh, it was new things that they had to learn really quickly. Um, I think that uh, one thing I kept hearing was that they were really appreciative of the instructor's attempts to do, to, to shift things over um, in such a quick, uh, quick timeline. Um, and so uh, that came up quite a bit from the international students I spoke with. Another international student that I connected with and, and another couple of international students I connected with who live here on, uh, on campus at UW Claire, uh, talk a little bit about uh, feeling very isolated and feeling very alone because, you know, as international students, they had already built a community of students, whether they were other international students or they were uh, other students in their majors. And so being completely disconnected suddenly and so quickly from that community really made it difficult because the type of experience that they were looking for by coming to the United States as international students was really different than having to um, having to lose that community suddenly you know, changed the dynamics of what their expectations were about what their experience in college was going to be. They seemed to be very understanding overall, but for the most part, I, that was definitely something that came up thematically amongst the number of students that um, that I spoke with from the international students. Yeah. Yeah. Again, no. It's, it's. Oh, you were saying. And, and again, it's a, it's a relatively small number. If I remember correctly, it's about 250 to 275 international students total that we have, something like that. And I might be completely wrong. Um, and the group that you know I interact with regularly is a group of like 10 to 15 students that I see regularly. And so um, that's just a small slice of, of the international student population, by no means representative. But yeah, I'm sorry, right. I, I interrupted your question. Oh. Oh no, I was just going to comment on how unfortunate it is that like this has like disrupted like the college experience that they were hoping for, like by yeah. coming, you know, and then also having to do their schoolwork in completely different time zones mm -hmm. and working in group projects like that has to be so difficult. <laughs> like, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 faced unique situations that I had not thought of. <laughs> Uh, only because it's not something that I had to think about at that particular point. And so, you know, I certainly empathize for them. And I think they're doing the best that they can. We continue to say that too as well. Right. So how has COVID-19 affected how you're, like how you do your job, like your responsibilities or like how you like fulfill certain functions that it does? Um, I think we were very fortunate in the Office of Multicultural Affairs to some extent. I think first of all, like the reason why I say that is because we were already moving towards putting together an infrastructure of supporting students in the virtual platform. Um, over the last year, we actually started, well, we had everyone retrofitted with um, uh, webcams and technology so that they could work with students on the fly. And part of the reason for that was because we recognized a trend for a lot of incoming students, especially during this orientation, that there were some students that simply didn't have access to being on campus. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we were, uh, we were creating systems that were as accessible for all those populations of students. Uh, and so we offered opportunities for students to attend with us virtually, either by phone, by video conference, uh, and if possible, coming in and talking with us and working with us and engaging with us. Uh, and so we had the technology infrastructure in place already, and we had those systems in place. We had a lot of those things set up, and so at, at a moment's notice, we could meet with the student virtually. 
Uh, we had done the training with the staff too as well, so they were relatively uh, uh, ready to go. Um, the, the biggest thing that, in, that was interrupted regarding the work that we did was because we serve students and we, we technically are student services, it was really difficult to provide that uh, student services um, programming without being face-to-face -face with students. Um, on March 16th, on that Monday, when the Office of Multicultural Affairs was notified that we should begin transitioning to a virtual platform, that first week from March 16th to March 20th, what we actually did was we rotated in. So we, tra we slowly kind of transitioned to a fully virtual platform. We had one person in the office and everyone else was working from home. And every day we would rotate one person in the office who would be there while everyone else was outside uh, working from home. Um, and so that luckily we had the technology in place already, so it was really easy to just pick up our, our tablets or laptops or our mobile devices and just shift all of our work home. Uh, we had uh, access to you know cloud-based uh, services and things like that, and so we were able to access all of our all, all of our required documentation easily from home. Um, the programming, oh, I, 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 the one thing I regret the most is the fact that we had amazing programming <laughs> that uh, we had to postpone to cancel or to shift uh, and it took us about a month to really relearn those skills about how to do it well um, and you know I've always known that it takes more effort to do um, online classes because I've taken online classes before I've taught some online uh, and some virtual training seminars. And so it requires a different set of skills, a different set, uh, different mindset, different pedagogical strategies in order to, to do that well, not just as an instructor, but also as a coordinator, advisor, and staff member who's working with students. Um, and so um, the staff that I have, that we have in the Office of Multicultural Affairs are relatively young in their professional careers too as well. So they don't have the same type of experience. So training them up for that and giving some best practices and some pointers and practice and doing those things was uh, was was really good. Uh, I think it was it was an opportunity to grow their skill sets uh, that would help them beyond this one job alone. And uh, we really approached it in that particular manner. What skill sets do we need? How do we train up? And how do we prepare ourselves for not just this semester, but all the next semesters that will be coming up too. And so we also started thinking about uh, how we transition programs on the, in our events. And so some of the key events that we do is primarily community building events. We do a lot of educational events, speaker series events. So one of our speaker series that we have, the Blue World Dialogues, which is a monthly uh, discussion that we host a speaker uh, that have a discussion about uh, a social justice topic. Um, we postponed our, our April event um, just a little bit um, beyond what we normally would have because we usually do it the second week of the month. We ended up doing it at the end of April, and it worked surprisingly well. I, I think that it gave us just enough time to figure out the roles and responsibilities of technology, how to make it work, you know, how do you manage it in such a way that's going to be accessible to the public, to the students, to the faculty and staff, uh, but then also making sure that there's a level of security protocol in place. At that point, during the month of April in 2020, we were hearing a lot of uh, instances of uh, Zoom um, Zoom disruptions. Uh, people would be going in and trolling Zoom meetings, um, and, you know, trying to um, do a lot of inappropriate behavior in meetings that they weren't part of. You know, there was an incident that came up in regards to, I think it was in the University of California system, there was uh, 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 the Chinese Students Association or Chinese Student Alliance organization. They were having uh, an event and they were Zoom bombed. And I think this particular instance, you know, this person came in and they were uh, expressing uh, a lot of um, racial um, uh, like comments, inappropriate statements, uh, you know, showing swastikas and uh, inappropriate, completely racist, xenophobic, and uh, you know, horrible, horrible things. And, and so we were really concerned about what do we need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen because we were opening up this particular event for the public. And we were committed to that. I, I think that it was really important that we didn't want those incidences to minimize and limit the type of access that we want to give to students, to faculty, staff, and to the public about these really important topics. And that, and that topic ended up being you know, understanding coronavirus 
and the racism and xenophobia that came out of the coronavirus against Asian American populations, community members across the U.S., and particularly here in Wisconsin and uh, in our community. And so that turned out really well. We had a, a group of about you know 50 different individuals that uh, span faculty, staff, and students, and community members who came to that particular event to listen to the panel members that we had individuals in different areas of expertise regarding their immediate understanding of what was happening uh, with Asian American communities and populations and type of racism, xenophobia, and type of bias and hate incidents that were happening across the nation and across our region. And so, you know, I, I, I think that, I, I think that it is absolutely unfortunate, um, but I, I, I'm finding that there are a lot of examples of exceptionally wonderful things that are happening. People rising to the occasion uh, to help their neighbors and help each other out throughout these like, difficult times and this unprecedented time. And then there are examples of people who are um, going the complete opposite route where like the worst possible um, uh, behavior is coming out. And it's not just racial slurs and it's not just like bias. Uh, it's not just like microaggressions. It's like violence against these populations too as well there's uh, you know in san francisco there are instances in in throughout california instances of like violence perpetrated against individuals of asian descent and those are the things that worry me the most um you know the the specific violence and even if it isn't violent the, the trauma that can occur for different populations and um you know those are things i, I worry about whether or not our students will experience that and um, we just happen, we, I happen to be part of the bias and incidents response team. Uh, and as of today, you know, we've had three formal BERT incident reports that came through, specifically about that. You know, can, uh, can you repeat that? I wasn't yeah. able to pick it up. Yeah, my apologies. You know, I happen to be on the bias incidents reporting team, so the BERT oh. team. And uh, as a member, I see all the, the BERT reports that come through. So the BERT, B I R T, is the acronym for bias incident reporting team. And in those reports, like what we saw is that uh, as of today's date, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, we've seen three formal reports of bias incidents that came through that's directly related to um, bias discrimination and or hate against Asian American community members and populations and students um, that's related to the COVID-19. And so those are things that we continue to see. And, you know, it's my understanding that, um, you know, across the nation, a number of different organizations are trying to track those things. You know, there's one specific organization known as the uh, Asian Pacific and Policy Planning Council based out, out of California. And um, I, I think that as of last week, they saw reports of anywhere between 1,700 to 1,800 reports so far within a, a six week period um, of discrimination or hate of uh, violence against Asian American communities and populations because of that. Um, and in the state of Wisconsin, you know, there are at least 70 known cases of, you know, bias incidences um, in the, uh, in Oak Park community, there's at least seven, seven to 10 known cases um, that I'm aware of. Um, you know, there was one specific situation that was really close to home too as well. One of my neighbors actually, um, who is uh, Vietnamese, he came to me, um, uh, about two weeks ago, and he told me that he was at the, the local Walmart uh, on, on the south side of Eau Claire, and he told me that someone approached him and started yelling at him, uh, you know, started telling him to go back to China. You know, he's Vietnamese, he's not Chinese. And he kept telling the person, I'm not Chinese. Uh, and then, you know, it continued to escalate and it started to get violent. You know, at that particular point, the crowd had started gathering, and uh, fortunately, uh, you know, uh, violence didn't occur. You know, he was... Uh, it was lucky that uh, other individuals intervened on his behalf and uh, assisted him uh, and got him out of the situation. And uh, you know, that individual you know, had left for you know, law enforcement or other individuals or security was able to intervene too as well. So um, the, these things are happening. And um, those things are, are very real incidents that are not just happening across the nation, but also within our own community. And those things I worry about, you know, specifically if it's happening to my own neighbors and my own community members and I worry about how uh, how that impacts our students too as well here at UW Claire. Right yeah I was actually uh, I also was looking at the um, APPI report or the yeah. AAPI report uh, mm -hmm. the one I was looking at which was the March 19th to April 
March 19th to April 15th, where they yeah. had 1,497 reports and 69.8% mm -hmm. of those were verbal harassment. And I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on why you think people are like, what's inciting this like uh, racism and discrimination against Asian Americans? Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, that report just got updated, I think on the 13th of this month as well. And so um, that press release from April showed uh, about almost 1,497. And then just recently, uh, you know, they, uh, I, I think it was May 13th when the press release came out, the report okay. increased up to about uh, 1,700 so far. Um, so your question about why do I, what do I think is inciting this type of behavior? Mm -hmm. I think, I think that there, there's two parts to this. I think the first part is that it, it, this particular situation exacerbates the existing systems of oppression that are already in place. Uh, and so the underlying systems of racism, xenophobia, uh, homophobia, anti-blackness, anti-brown uh, sentiments, those are all uh, bubbling to the surface, so to speak, in this particular situation. And we see this as kind of a pattern uh, during economic downturns, during um, significant um, um, national uh, crises, uh, when there is, uh, when, when there are situations of fear within the narrative of the nation or within the region, oftentimes these types of sentiments come out biases, you know, racism, homophobia, those types of different types of things. And so I think that the first part of the answer really is as to why this is happening is that it's simply revealing what's already there. Um, you know, uh, the type of biases that we have are simply being exacerbated. And, you know, oftentimes mm -hmm. we say that, you know, in um, when we aren't utilizing our critical thinking skills, our instincts kick in. And oftentimes our instincts are based off of many of our biases and our, pre our preconceived ideas and stereotypes. And so, because we operate in like these systems and these, uh, you know, these moments of fear, our instincts really want us to be very defensive and the defensiveness like causes our biases to be uh, exacerbated. And so this is part of the reason why when we do a lot of campus climate things, we talk a lot about our personal biases. We ask people to examine their personal biases because oftentimes the awareness of it helps us to understand why we're feeling these ways so we can address them, address the biases to minimize them. Um, and so that, I think that's the first part of the, uh, the answer. Um, the second part of the answer, I think, really is that there is a dominant narrative about the fact that, the, that uh, it's understanding that um, the, the coronavirus that we see today, COVID-19, originated from Wuhan, China. Um, at least that's, that's the narrative right now. And that's the, the dominant theory behind uh, you know, where that originated from. And so that exacerbates the situation too as well regarding the racism towards Asian American populations. Um, and so there is this idea that um, anyone who looks Asian must be representative of that particular um, nation, that nationality. And that it is because of these um, the traditions and the economic systems within um, China, but specifically the, the wet markets that, um, you know, exacerbate and created this. And so it's just so easy to scapegoat that particular population, that particular nation, in a way that uh, takes a lot of responsibility away from them. And so I think that, that has a lot to do with that too. And so I think that, that those are two big things to, as to why I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of this happening. So you mentioned uh, what happened to your neighbor at yeah. your local Walmart. Uh, how else has COVID-19 uh, outbreak affected your community? That's a great question. I think that there, you know, I want to go back to the fact that um, what I said before about how it impacts my community it, it really is indicative of what I said before too, as well, my previous answer, in that COVID-19, this global pandemic has exacerbated so many of our institutions and our vulnerabilities that are part of our institutions and our social systems. Uh, like for example, what we're seeing is, a, is that um, black and brown communities are, have um, disproportionately negative impact in regards to health disparities you know, related to COVID-19. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, the numbers that in statistics we articulated about the number of cases that we see in Wisconsin, a huge proportion of that is in the Milwaukee, Dane County, Southern Wisconsin, Southeast Wisconsin area, 
Green Bay is another huge area too as well. And those happen to be the Fox Valley area has a big population of not just Asian communities, but also Latinx community members too as well. And so a lot of our African American community members is in, is in Milwaukee uh, in that particular area. And then you know, taking into consideration the fact that Milwaukee is one of the most segregated places in the United States, um, that is one of the biggest concerns, their access to affordable health care, their access to the medical care, their access to emergency care, uh, their access to preventative care. And so those health disparities are exacerbated in this situation too as well. And so uh, the number of individuals who are taking care of our food, those who, the individuals, the, the, um, the documented and undocumented workers uh, who uh, work on farms, uh, the migrant workers, you know, oftentimes they're the ones who have are essential workers, so they have to continue working. We're seeing that this on, so we're seeing this, um, this the systems of oppression from the lens of race as one particular piece. We also see it as through the lens of class too, as well. You know, the the areas in which we see a lot of economic components where we deem essential workers, grocery store workers, retail workers, you know, farm workers, they're you know, oftentimes lower class um, uh, family members, uh, individuals from lower socioeconomic status families that are working these essential jobs. And they're being asked to continue working, you know, and in some cases they're, they're working in conditions that are not safe. They're working without personal protective equipment to some extent too as well, at least at, at first when it was really difficult to get a hold of a lot of personal protective equipment. And so asking those individuals as essential workers to continue working when I myself as a white collar uh, employee am able to work from home with my own internet access because I work in an office and that, that work can translate to doing work at, um, uh, at home. We even see it at UW-Eau Claire too as well. You know, like we had to, we, we, our institution looked at how do we support the budget crisis on campus. And one way to do that was to furlough staff part of the decision-making process was to look at our staff members able to do work from home. Now, a disproportionate number of those staff members who are furloughed are in facilities. There are, there are custodial staff, those individuals who work in facilities at UW Claire. Those are the people who are disproportionately asked to be furloughed. And they're already the ones who are, have you know, the least pay to some extent um, on campus. And so we see this disproportionate impact not just uh, from a racial uh, lens, but also from a class lens. Um, and, and so those are the things that I see. You know, we also look at different vulnerable populations too as well, you know, within different counties, like the different jail systems that we have. You know, we're seeing that COVID-19 is spreading, uh, spreading really quickly through the jail population too as well. Uh, and that's a significant concern that I continue to have. Many other, many other individuals continue to have too as well individuals who I've worked with, such as Susan Wolfram, Dr. Susan Wolfram and David Carlson and Francis, other individuals who have been like sounding the alarm for like weeks and for months about the possibility that this is gonna be problematic. And the fact that there wasn't any good data that came out uh, until very recently uh, about the outbreaks within the jail systems is really problematic. The uh, availability of personal protective equipment and uh, the inability to keep social distancing in those very confined areas has been like a, a significant concern. And yes, not just the concern isn't just about those individuals uh, who are imprisoned in the um, in, in the county and in state jails, but also the corrections workers too, as well. Uh, those individuals uh, are disproportionately impacted too, as well. And so, you know, I really worry about those vulnerable populations and those individuals who work really closely with those vulnerable populations. And so, um, those are other ways in which uh, COVID nineteen has impacted my community and the work that I do and the sphere of influence and sphere of colleagues that I have and the work that they do. Right. Yeah. And then alongside that being that uh, these people who are in these lower socioeconomic mm -hmm. um, positions, like they're now deemed essential workers, but yeah. if they're at like health at risk, you know, then they may not want to go into work, but then that would mean losing their job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so it, it's, it's a cyclical system and it is problematic. And um, I, I think that really what I'm hoping that we are able to do is that when we come out of this, that we have an opportunity to examine the social systems that are in place and the practices that we have, you know, understanding that uh, any, at any particular point, 
not just this pandemic, but any other future crisis that comes up, whether it's a regional crisis or it's a national crisis or it's another global crisis, that we're going to continue to see the exacerbation of these systems of oppression, regardless of what lens you look through it, whether like class, nationality, race, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, what have you. Um, you know, those things are continuing to be exacerbated. And, and, and I think part of the work that my staff does in the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the work that I do, the things that I'm really passionate about is making sure that we're aware of what those look like and then putting strategies in place through policy and through systemic changes so that it minimizes those things while times are good or decent, relatively speaking, so that when we have crisis, that it doesn't get exacerbated in those sorts of ways. You know, we also see um, the, the different resources that are available for students too as well. You know, like uh, when, when we look at other populations, we're looking at rural versus urban uh, um, uh, hometowns. Uh, I work with a lot of students from rural hometowns and, you know, across the campus, we actually have quite a few, uh, quite a high proportion of students who come from rural communities, regardless of, uh, regardless of race, regardless of background. Uh, and the, oftentimes, they have the least amount of access to high, high speed internet, uh, broadband access. Uh, and so that's another population to worry about from a student's perspective, you know, helping them get the correct technology and the, uh, is one thing, but if the infrastructure isn't there, it's really difficult to continue that type of work. I had a student who was, who had to go, who had to stand outside his neighbor's house in order for him to use his neighbor's Wi-Fi. Uh, and he had to do that for about four weeks. Um, and his neighbor was really generous and, you know, who tried to make sure that, um, you know, it was, he was as comfortable as possible and definitely wanted to help out. So, you know, it, it, it's not that, um, that people were vindictive and didn't want to do it. I mean, they were still trying to practice social distancing, uh, but still being able to provide the, the access to that, uh, those services, and that type of infrastructure as much as possible. And so those are some of the situations that we've been some of our students and uh, we're very fortunate that we were able to get that student connected with some of the emergency funding that's available uh, through UW Clare and through the foundation office and through the, the Federal Cares Act uh, in order to get the appropriate technology to make sure that they could actually get access after those four weeks. Now, now we're on finals week. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, but I'm thinking kind of long term about those things. Those are some very real concerns that we have, some decisions that we need to make about what we're going to do to minimize that, uh, the impact and the disproportionate impact that, that has on populations of students and community members moving forward. Right, so using your position does help build an infrastructure to, so that like when, the, so if anything like this or mm -hmm. like happens again, like you'll be able to help students out. Is that yeah. what, kind of what you're trying to do right now? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, that's what we've been doing uh, within the Office of Multicultural Affairs, you know, and in my, in my role specifically too as well, identifying what those barriers happen to be and create intentional system structures that will be long-term and, and sustainable. Um, be, um, and it just so happens that we're applying it in a civil capacity during this period of time too as well. And so admittedly, I see this situation through that social justice lens. You know, understanding the disproportionate impact that this has on different populations, especially vulnerable populations or traditionally underserved populations, um, and that uh, that term, the vulnerable populations, uh, may shift from um, situation to situation. Um, but you know, it it really is something that is important to me. It's the way that I see the world. It's the way that I see this. It's the way that I interpret how this pandemic is impacting myself, impacting my staff, impacting my students, impacting the community. Um, and impacting the globe, you know, and so on. So that's just how I see things. Right. So how have the people around you and within your community, how have you been seeing them responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? It varies. That's a great question. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen some, uh, some people kind of uh, frozen in place to some extent. Not living mm -hmm. close, but like, just unsure what to do, so they just can't do anything uh, or don't do anything. And that's kind of, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's that fight or flight or freeze response uh, really is part of it. And you know, that may be born out of you know, historical trauma or other, uh, other reasons too as well. But you know, so I've seen that, uh, the, the anxiety leading to just a, a frozen state, unsure what to do, and so they just 
disconnect, disengage completely. I've seen individuals who have like really risen above and beyond any anyone's expectations, have proactively reached out to their neighbors, you know, and work really closely with uh, different organizations to uh, to try to find ways to get uh, different populations, different vulnerable populations connected. Yeah, you know, I, I know of one particular person who I worked with prior who worked with the school district and, you know, they were sending out information as much as possible to try to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the school meals were still accessible for a lot of students and their families. And so, you know, that's one way, and those are some examples that I've seen community responding to that. Um, you know, I, I've seen um, different businesses um, uh, and different nonprofit organizations, you know, intentionally raising money for different causes, specifically for different populations that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic too as well. Um, and so, those are some examples that I've seen. And you know, of course, the racism, the xenophobia, the bias, the hate that's against the discrimination, all those are responses to as well to this, you know, kind of part of that, that fight portion of it. And I think that the fight side, you know, some of it is uh, is displayed as you know the racism you know, from that that really negative extreme to the extreme positive where part of their their instinct to fight this is to do as much good as possible in the world. Um, and, and so uh, I've seen a lot of examples of those pieces. Uh, I, I know that some of the uh, some of the day to day things that I see are people figuring out how to be how to play multiple roles that they didn't have to uh, before. Like um, I know that there are a number of individuals who have to be not just um, employees working uh, a regular full time shift, but they have to be teachers and to educate their kids. Uh, and then they're also, you know, caretakers, maybe they're taking care of like elderly uh, family members or, or other individuals who are, who would potentially be vulnerable to the pandemic, to the COVID-19. Uh, and so they have to play kind of like a, a healthcare provider, a direct provider. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that it, I've seen a wide variety of responses from different people uh, and different members of the media community here in the Chippewa Valley. You know, I, I, what I see is that, you know, uh, what I'm really proud of too as well is how a lot of our nonprofit organizations, like the Pablo Center and their foundations have really stepped up to try to, you know, provide resources and uh, to try to do things that would uh, take people's minds off of, of the pandemic. I, I remember right away, a lot of the immediate response was to give things for people to do. Like I remember um, like uh, on, on social media, there were a lot of, random challenges for people to do and people would kind of like try to do that just to try to pass the time try to take their minds off of the negativity surrounding the pandemic um you know try to build a sense of community um uh and then now the trend that i'm seeing right now is a lot of foundations are actively trying to gather the resources and trying to actively support you know the businesses the small uh, the small town businesses you know they're actually trying to provide grants and resources for you know, farmers or actively trying to get connect farmers with um, with people, uh, and so that uh, the food doesn't go to waste because like the supply chain is is, is um, you know um, seeing some stresses, and so uh, the you know, again I'm just seeing a wide variety of responses. So, how would you say COVID nineteen has changed your relationship with your community? That's a good question. Um, I haven't had a lot of time to think about that because I, I feel that my relationship with the community has, has, it's always been from a place of trying, trying to address inequities in on campus and in the community. And, you know, in order to do that, it requires you to already be um, knowledgeable and connected with other stakeholders who are doing those things, other community members, other agencies who are doing that. So working closely with nonprofit organizations already, and working closely with different institutional departments on campus and off campus. Um, and so I think that what it has done, if anything, is that it's strengthened the need and the understanding that collaborative work is absolutely vital in order to do this work. Um, and I think that all of those stakeholders who work with those vulnerable populations and those different populations of individuals, whether they're working with homeless individuals or whether they're working with people of color or they're working, um, you know, with people from uh, low-income families, I think that the realization now is that uh, more so now than, than ever before, it requires a concerted, coordinated effort 
from multiple directions in order to address those issues. And addressing the pandemic of this scale requires a coordinated effort too as well. And so I, I, I don't know if it's changed the types of relationships that I had, but what, I think that what it has done, it's really reinforced the fact that these collaborative relationships are really important because you can't address poverty without addressing racism. You can't address racism without addressing homophobia. You can't address homophobia without addressing um, you know, homelessness. You, know, uh, you can't address those things. They're all intersectional to some extent. And so it requires kind of like that really big picture thinking about like how these issues all kind of impact each other. Right, right. It's kind of like uh, COVID has been like just like shown a giant spotlight on yeah. all of our problems. And it's like now we're like a, a few, like a good majority of us mm -hmm. are home now. And it's like us like having the time now to reflect. Do you like what kind of, where do you think uh, your community will be going after? Like, what changes do you think could be made? That's a good question. And um, it, it goes to something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, to best answer that question, I think, that, I think that first I have to say that you know, there's a lot of talk about going back to normal. And, and I don't think we can go back to normal because normal, there was already these systems of oppression in place. And I think that uh, to answer your question about where do I think that we need to go or where do I think that we're going to go, you know, you're absolutely right that this is this pandemic has shined a light on, on and glaringly so, the holes and the gaps that we have in our systems. Um, we've always had them there, uh, and this is the systems uh, and the holes within the systems are it's nothing new. What I'm hoping that we'll be able to do is uh, moving forward, at the very least, we'll be able to gain more allies uh, in this particular work primarily the raising the awareness in of itself at minimum is really helpful uh, where we can reference this particular situation and articulate that this is one example in this pandemic of how a systemic issue negatively impacted a, uh, a, a, a population of individuals um, through no fault of their own. And so I, I think that what I'm hoping to do is at minimum that this pandemic raises awareness of how systemic oppression operates and how it, how the, consequences of these systems of oppression, whether well-intentioned or not, when they were created, um, are disproportionately spread through different populations. Um, and then I think that beyond that, what I'm hoping to do is that once that level of awareness increases, that there are individuals in elected positions, in positions of power, positions of influence who can um, lead the appropriate changes to help address these issues on that larger systemic scale. Because supporting one person through racist infinity is another, but breaking down those systemic issues and policies and practices and, and stereotypes so that a larger group of people don't have to deal with uh, the consequences of those stereotypes is really the end goal of what it is that we're trying to do, or at least what I'm trying to do in, in the work that we do with uh, the multiple partners that we have who address different uh, types of oppression, different types of uh, inequities. Um, and I honestly, I'm still trying to figure that out myself too as well, about the how. You know, I think there are some strategies that we utilize, such as training, you know, uh, awareness raising, you know, um, campaigning for specific policies and addressing how different policies impact different populations, coming up with new ideas about how to, how to, how to address those policies, how to change those policies, how to change those practices. You know, it really is what I'm hoping, a culture shift that we're looking at. What I'm really hoping is that we create new traditions, new ideas, new norms about what is normal and natural. And I'm hoping that those things will lead to the minimization and elimination of a lot of these stereotypes and uh, systemic issues that kind of like are born out of those. Right. So yeah. how have municipal leaders and government officials in your community responded to the outbreak? Um... In, in the Chippewa Valley, I think that what I have been really appreciative of is that uh, all the leaders that I have seen that have been very visible have been really, um, really adamant about following, um, um, following the advice of the health experts regarding how we respond, you know, how we stay safe, uh, different types of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
um, have really appreciated that, uh, not just uh, from a county standpoint, from the Eau Claire City County Health Department, but also within the region and to some extent within the state and on campus too as well. You know, I have those conversations a lot with my team, my staff about, you know, how do we, how do we eventually go back to work on campus in a safe way? Uh, and then we're looking at CDC guidelines, you know, the institution's looking at CDC guidelines, the uh, county's looking at CDC guidelines. Uh, and I think that uh, looking at expert advice is kind of part of what we do at institutions of higher education. Uh, I, I think that that's something that we, we look for. You know, we, we identify who those individuals are who have the most experience, the most knowledge, um, and, and are able to provide that level of guidance and appropriate resources to implement those guidances. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really happy to see that uh, our elected leaders and our community leaders, and even those leaders who are leaders of part of like community agencies and nonprofit organizations, uh, and even like businesses, um, you know, those those influential individuals are very closely trying to follow CDC guidelines as much as possible to try to maximize the safety. So, I, I think that's my first impression of of what I see. Um, I, I think they're just like everyone else. I think they're doing they're doing their best with the limited amount of information that we have, um, partly because it happened relatively quickly. Um, and, you know, looking for the appropriate guidelines to help inform their decision making. You know, they don't have anyone else to look to in the recent history about, you know, how they should respond, how they should um, close down businesses, how they should reopen businesses. And so and I, I think that with the limited amount of information, exercising those critical thinking skills. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that they're doing that. <laughs> right. So I don't, know if, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, no, you did. You did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and how your community government has been responding. But mm -hmm. do, do you have any thoughts on how like the local, state, or federal leaders are responding to things like the crisis differently? I think... What I am observing is that different states, different counties, different areas, different regions are doing things ever so slightly differently. And there are pros and cons to that, I think. I think that you know, a level of understanding about what's happening on a local level is absolutely vital. Uh, but it has to be balanced out with a much more coordinated effort, too, as well. And I think that um, I, I think that we, ha we don't have the right balance of a wider strategy coupled with local decision making. Um, and so I, I think that it continues to exacerbate the situation. And personally, it exacerbates my own anxiety about the situation too. Um, I, I think that, um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that personally, I'm disappointed to see that there isn't more of a coordinated effort. Uh, and part of that is because I, 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 I tend to look at things from a systemic level. Uh, and so uh, understanding the nuance and the, the need to have agency at an individual level to make decisions and at the same time a coordinated effort about what the larger and wider strategy is, is really important. And so there's some nuance to that. But yeah, I personally, I'm just disappointed to see that on a national scale, there isn't much of a, of a, of a well-communicated effort. Um, and it feels kind of like a free-for-all to some extent, which makes it much more difficult to coordinate efforts. You know, seeing different states, like for example, I know that uh, the New England states, uh, Maine, New York, um, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, I believe, you know, are, are working together to identify like, how they will coordinate together. You know, in the Western states, California, Washington, Oregon, and I, I think are kind of coordinating their efforts about how and when and under what conditions to open to as well. So there's some larger systemic uh, uh, things being put into place. You know, in the Midwest, we have kind of that Midwest Compact and Coalition too as well, right? It was uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, and Illinois. I think we kind of will try and work together to try to identify what those conditions are for all of us to open up to as well. Or originally we were doing that. Uh, I think that's kind of gone out the window ever since the Supreme Court struck down the Safe at Home um, um, directive from the governor. Um, but 
I, I think that those coordinated efforts on a larger scale, the larger the scale, the coordinated effort, the better it is. Uh, and then coupled with a level of nuance that provides agency for decision making on the local level is helpful too. And I don't know what that balance is. You know, I don't have any expertise in, in global pandemics or in in government or politics, but you know, it, from just a local person, it just feels it, it 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 feels more chaotic than it has to be. And it adds to the anxiety that already exists. Right. Right. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So on a little bit more personal question, uh, yeah. have you uh, know anyone who's gone sick with COVID-19? Yes, um, I do, I do, I do. Uh, some of them are, are distant friends, distant relatives. Um, and uh, the individuals that I do know have, have recovered. There's, there's my, well, most of the individuals that I know have recovered. Uh, there's one person that I do know that um, had a really difficult time um, with uh, with it, so was put on a ventilator for quite some time, and uh, you know they recovered. But still, um, it it is just hearing about the situation is devastating. Yeah, you know, oh, we're happy to see that they recovered, but I, I think that though, you know, what we forget is that um, recovery from from it is one thing, but you know, life after that can change. Like this person was already, um, was not part of a vulnerable group, um, but was older in age. And uh, you know, this particular person, you know, continues uh, while, you know, most of the symptoms and respiratory issues have subsided, um, you know, like, um, they, they continue to have, you know, like chest pain, they continue to have, um, you know, light coughs um, that continue on after that. Um, they're still able to function on a day-to-day -day basis, but their lives, their health is never going to be the same. You know, right. Being put uh, under a ventilator, according to this person, is really, um, really intrusive process. So it's my understanding from, from the anecdote that this person gave me. I don't know if this is kind of across the board. I've never been put on a ventilator. I've never seen it happen. I don't know anything about what that looks like, but you know, from this one unique experience, you know, it's my understanding that, you know, that, that particular two has to be, um, you know, forcibly um, put into their lungs and then they have to force air into the lungs at a rate that is, you know, that allows them to get enough oxygen into, into the lungs and that the, the forcing the air into the lungs, you know, that, that can be um, physically traumatic to, to the body. And so I, I, I don't know what's going to happen um, in the future. For this individual, I, I I imagine and I hope that I hope that you know there's a level of recovery that will happen over time that uh, they have will have uh, some normalcy in regards to functionality of their their lungs and their body. But I don't know. And then you know you hear on the news, and not connected to anyone that I know, but that you know people heal and recover just fine to some extent from this. And uh, so I, it seems to be a wide spectrum of recovery for different people. Um, so yeah, yeah. So personally, yeah, I, I, I do know some distant relatives and some distant individuals um, that have been impacted by COVID-19 and have recovered. Uh, you know, I was speaking to a student, actually, a student told me that his, his brother, who was a healthcare worker in a different state, actually uh, contracted COVID-19 too as well. And, um, um, fortunately, the symptoms, while they were bad symptoms, they didn't require the person to go uh, into the hospital and uh, be on the ventilator, but they since recovered from that and you know, has, was under a three-week quarantine uh, following that recovery. And so that's very fortunate too as well. So our students are seeing that uh, as well. And so I hear about those things too as well, not just from the community, but also from our students and their experiences from um, their relatives or you know their friends or their group of, uh, of, of community members. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I need a drink of water. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a fully fledged question in my head yet, but uh, because you mentioned earlier about how there's been a higher rate 
of COVID cases with people who are in um, who are minorities mm -hmm. and who have um, are in lower so socioeconomic mm -hmm. sections. Like, so how do you think like so then like after COVID, like if they recover, like mm -hmm. those effects like afterwards are still going to be there. Yeah. Right. So like, what are your that's not really a question, but do you have any thoughts on that? If I'm hearing you correctly, I, I think what you're what I'm hearing you asking me is, you know, what are my thoughts in regards to what life might look like with those particular populations, communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the health outcomes of COVID-19? Exactly. And you're absolutely like, yeah, yeah. You know, like um, the the ongoing statistics continue to show that black and brown communities are disproportionately impacted on a health basis by COVID-19. And that has the, there are a lot of likely reasons. Uh, you know, and a number of different theories and different, uh, um, you know, touch points basically is about their access to preventative health uh, care services, their, um, you know, their access to health care in and of itself, um, you know, whether they have a, a job that, that, you know, has good health care coverage, uh, even the cost of health care coverage, even when it's covered to some extent, pseudo covered, um, you know, what that looks like. And so um, access is one thing, but their ability to actually afford and utilize uh, some of it has to do with cultural stigmas about utilizing those services too as well. I think that has less to do with it, but there's certainly some, uh, uh, there may be some components of that too as well. But I, I, I think that what I, what I continue to worry about really are those long-term effects that that's going to have on these communities. Because we see that under normal circumstances, you can go broke and go bankrupt from one very acute health condition. Uh, especially if it ends up um, you know, leading to like a chronic conditions. Um, and that requires constant follow-up and constant uh, health, health care maintenance. Um, and, you know, because these populations that are being hit, those individuals who are from traditionally lower socioeconomic households uh, and communities and uh, communities that are black and brown and are underrepresented, um, I, I think that what I'm worried about is that it's going to continue to exacerbate the economic inequalities that already exist in these communities. Um, from, from just from an economic standpoint and that particular lens, and again, I don't have any expertise in economics or any of those things, but I do know that, and I do strongly suspect that because of the existing economic uh, inequalities that already did exist in these um, communities, and on top of that, the the disproportionate impact of the health disparities and the health issues that have uh, impacted those communities. There, I, I don't see how we, they would not have a disproportionate economic impact in those communities too as well. And it has an ongoing cycle, you know, because the economic system is so dependent on, um, on, on income and tax collection, you know, that has direct impact on um, their ability to maintain um, jobs. Uh, it has a direct impact on their ability to maintain different types of jobs. Uh, and then that impacts the ability for the local community to collect taxes and invest back into the community. And those investments back in the community, because those are, those are going to be pulled, maybe pulled back. You know, I, I worry that that may have ongoing um, issues with those communities. You know, like we, we have historically had like policies in place that separated black and brown community members, the ghettoization of the urban landscape to some extent. Um, and this pandemic is, I'm afraid, going to continue to exacerbate the inequities. You know, it's funny because like right now when you're looking at the economic standpoint, <laughs> top 1%, top 2% of, of income earners have not lost a lot of money. In fact, because a lot of them own like essential businesses, they continue to to see the benefits of this. And I, I don't think they're intentionally trying to benefit to it. I think that while they're providing an essential service and essential business, essential systems and economic uh, infrastructure, I, I, it, I, I can't express how, how frustrated I continue to be uh, in regards to the disproportionate distribution of economic resources across those communities. Right, right. It's these people are putting their lives 
potentially on the line or risking uh, having like a chronic like health problem for like for who knows how long mm -hmm. uh, yet they're not being paid enough to uh, receive treatment or they're afraid of losing their jobs uh, and the people at the top are like barely like losing money like you know or not yeah. losing money but uh, are still more focused on their profits. Well, I don't know if they're, I, I don't want to mistake or no, you anything. Yeah, it, it, it really is, uh, I think what it is, is that the system is set up in such a way that they will benefit from this. Now, it, it doesn't mean that there's some evil plan uh, from these business owners. I, I really don't think that that happens in the case. It just happens to be that they already accumulate a lot of this financial resources. And then because they're essential services, they're gonna continue to benefit and accum accumulate more of those resources. And we're seeing that those populations that are uh, disproportionately impacted negatively are continuing to lose more of those resources because they have to invest more portion of their income to support their livelihoods. You know, losing their jobs is one thing, but also having to invest in healthcare on their own, all these different types of things. And so I don't think it comes from malice, but it's really a systemic issue. It comes from the way it's set up to benefit them whether they want to benefit or not, it's just the way that it's set up, unfortunately. And right. I, I, you know, there are things that we can do from a policy standpoint that can kind of like help with that particular picture. And I don't know what those policies would be. I have some ideas, um, but again, not being a politician, a lawmaker, or having experience doing that, I, I don't know. Um, and yeah, yeah, and so I, I think it's certainly nuanced and it's a complicated situation, but it's something that we definitely need to address. You know, I'm worried about how how essential workers, uh, one thing that, that I did appreciate kind of uh, at first was when essential workers were asked to continue working, you know, they got accolades. People were, you know, uh, were really gung ho about the essential workers, you know, and we are, we, uh, we, we gave them a recognition that the work that they do is going to keep us alive, literally keep us alive, uh, maintaining manufacturing, maintaining um, the construction work, maintaining like uh, the food supply chain. Those are all things that literally will keep us alive. Um, but at the same time, they're symbolic accolades. You know, like we give them a high five, we give them, a, we give them uh, you know, like a, a moment in spotlight. But when the spotlight fades, they're the ones who are gonna have to deal with all the negative implications and negative consequences that have been disproportionately thrust on their shoulders because they're essential workers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there was an example um, that I heard of in, uh, like, uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom has a national health services, kind of like a, um, a socialized system of medicine. And, you know, doctors and, and, and nurses are paid through, um, through that particular system. And uh, there's this one particular individual um, who had articulated that, you know, at first he was really appreciative. Uh, because like every day at like 7 or 8 p.m. people would stand outside their buildings and they would clap and this is national outpouring this, this would happen on a daily basis and at first he you know it, it, he said that he didn't anticipate to be to feel so proud and so choked up and so happy to see that type of support but um, you know as he spoke to other healthcare workers in the national health system and again this is in the UK and Britain um, you know they had articulated that they were concerned about that you know that it was, it was just symbolic accolades symbolic support because two or three years actually i think over a period of five to ten years there has been degrading support and degrading financial investment in the national health services in britain and so um you know where uh, some of these medical providers were saying like where was the public support when they needed the funding to support you know the doctors to support the, the technology to support the hospital systems and then now they're out there clapping which is great but it doesn't change the system. It doesn't provide the investment that's needed to do the work that, you, that to, to keep people healthy and safe. And so applying that here in, in, in the US and specifically in Chile Valley, yes, essential workers should be commended. Essential businesses should be commended. But at the same time, if we're gonna commend them and we're gonna recognize the fact that they are essential workers, why don't we pay them more? Why don't we give them the, the, the appropriate resources so that they can survive? And so those are the things that I, that I have worked with colleagues and stakeholders and agencies across uh, uh, the community to, to at least raise a question and try to 
um, advocate for better support systems in place. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Abby, yeah, I no, talk like, a lot, I, so I, I hope that, I no, hope that I'm giving you <laughs> useful information. No, no, I love, I love everything you're saying. You're, you, you, you have a lot of insight and it's being <laughs> like, like, I'm just really, like, it's like taking a moment. <laughs> I'm yeah. just like having to process. You know, one thing that I appreciate about this particular historical archival project is the fact that I, um, you know, we often say that you, know, you have to learn history so that you don't repeat it. You know, and, I, and I fear that we continue to repeat, um, repeat things because we're not learning about the 1918 pandemic. We're not learning about, you know, the, the systems of oppression that have been in place. And, you know, and I'm really, really hoping that because this is a global, this pandemic is on a global scale, that we're going to learn from this particular piece. And I'm hoping that some of the, the anecdotes and the stories um, that, uh, that this project captures is going to be useful for future generations so that they understand that this is a very real, um, a, 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 a very real situation that, um, that needs to be picked apart, that needs to be interrogated, that needs to be really understood because I think that there, there are so many stories to tell and there's so many lessons to learn from this situation, this global pandemic in and of itself and, you know, uh, figuring out how we can apply those lessons here in the local area. I, I really hope that we're going to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, me too. Just like, especially just, because for a lot of history, what was recorded was always uh, like official proclamations or, you know, just yeah. the people at the top. And when like people started like keeping diaries, you know, or like yeah. when we're able to like recover them, like that's where we get so much insight of what things were actually like. And yeah. so what these oral interviews is kind of, it's kind of, it's an oral, it's like a little bit of a diary. It's, yeah. <laughs> or uh, it's just capturing like what this moment is like right now, how you are seeing it. Mm -hmm. So then like people can hopefully look back and see all these videos and see how all these different people experienced it differently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, from um, uh, another thing that I, that I think about a lot too as well, and from things that I'm hearing from other people, um, but for myself, and, and I don't want to speak on their behalf, I guess, I guess like on, on just for myself, I, I think the hardest part about this particular pandemic is just not knowing if there is an end. Um, I think that level of uncertainty, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that you've heard different versions of this um, as well in different um, stories and different um, um, from different people, but not knowing what to, what, if there is an end, go, if there's an end time, like if the, if someone said that definitively this will be done in a month, okay, you know, we can wait or definitely this will be done in five years. Okay. That's a little longer, but there's something to look forward to. Uh, the fact that there's a level of hyper ambiguity and uncertainty. You know, that adds to that level of anxiety too as well. And um, so I, I think that that's, that's, that that's the hardest part to deal with. Because um, I have kids too, I have two kids. I have a five-year-old and I have a two-year-old. And I, I don't always know what to tell them. Um, they know that there's a lot of sick people. You know, we tell them that, um, uh, that we can't go to the playground, that we can't go to school. Um, and, you know, we, we go outside and, we have them wear masks. Uh, they want to go to the store with mom and dad. When we go to the store, we tell them they can't go because there's lots of people outside. They can't wait to go back to school. They can't wait to go back and play with their friends. Um, you know, they want to, to um, see their teachers. And, you know, a single look on their faces of how bored they are <laughs> keeping them entertained um, has, 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 has um, exercised that particular skill set for me. Um, and so I, I, I wonder what they're going to remember out of this. Those, those kids who are, who are the ages of my children, the five-year-olds and two-year-olds, you know, what will they remember? Will this be something that uh, will be heavily influential? And I suppose that, that differs because my kids are very lucky, you know, they have internet access at home. They have a plethora of, uh, of, um, videos to watch if they want to they have educational materials that they can play with and so i occupy a very privileged positionality economically socially um uh and in the household and so 
they it, the, the impact that they will see may not be as negative, may not be as long lasting, they may not be as traumatic as other individuals who are, whose household may have lost their job. You know, we have students who both parents have lost their jobs. And so, you know, just thinking about that and the type of ongoing trauma that that's going to, to create within the household and within those students and within those individuals. So I don't know what my kids are gonna experience. I don't know what they're gonna remember. And I really hope that they remember um, some positive things about this. And I hope that they remember that this was a time that there was a pandemic, that there were a lot of sick people. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I worry about my kids, um, about what that's going to look like, what the world is going to look like for them. Right, like it, it's going to be very interesting to see like their generation. Yeah. Like because like, they're at such an impressionable age, like this is the age like when they start uh, interacting or like yeah. broadening with the outside world. You know, like yeah. seeing like past their like immediate family, but yeah. now, like now they need like we have to um, self isolate. You know, and it's they're not getting that experience. Yeah. No, Abby, I, I don't know. I, I actually, uh, are you a graduate student or an undergraduate? Student? Oh, I'm an undergraduate. I'm actually okay. graduating. Yeah. Oh well, congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a couple days. Four more. Yeah. Kind yep. of, well, <laughs> yeah. One more final. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and and I asked that question because you know I'm a millennial. I'm still in my uh, my mid 30s. I don't know if I said this in regards to my demographics, but you know I identify as Asian American, specifically Hmong American, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm 36 years old. Um, but uh, as a millennial, you know I, I heard someone say this, and I'll, I'm going to try to repeat some of it. But you know our particular generation, the millennial generation, you know we went through um, we went through we saw the the tech bubble. Um, explosion uh, in the economic standpoint. Uh, we went through um, the, uh, the housing crisis. We went through the, the economic uh, bust in recession, the Great Recession in 2008. You know, we went through 9-11, and that, was, that happened when I was in high school. Uh, we went through, uh, uh, we, we actually, I remember like in, in the 90s, uh, growing up and like the advent of the internet age just starting to come out. Uh, and then now we're going through um, another likely recession and we're going through this pandemic and, uh, and then the student debt crisis, you know, I, I, I feel that this millennial generation is, uh, my, my specific generation has seen such a wide variety of, of significant historical milestones. Um, and, you know, I remember, um, I had a professor when I was a college student and they would always talk about the day that John F. Kennedy died. And that was the defining moment of their particular generation. That was one very specific thing. That was just one thing. I have a feeling that when people ask me that question, it's gonna be a laundry list of things that have defined my particular generation. <laughs> and, I, I've, I, and I'm absolutely confident that this particular global pandemic is gonna be on that laundry list of your generation Abby, as well. And I, I can't imagine what the next, next years are gonna bring for you too as well. Right, right, yeah. yeah. No, it's just, uh, that's another thing where looking back, it's gonna be really interesting. Where like, um, you more so than me. Uh, yeah. I think I fall into Gen Z, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely but, sure either, but yeah. But like in your adult life, you've gone through now two, like with this being the second, mm -hmm. economic recessions, while you're yeah. still forming your like, or cementing like yeah. yourself, like in your own economic standpoint, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's going to be interesting looking back on all of this in the future years, but uh, how do you think this is going to affect people like um, mentally? Like how is COVID like, do you think um, affecting people mentally right now? And that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, um, as as a, as a for historical context and self disclosure, you know, I, I'm really comfortable sharing that. You know, I myself before the pandemic was already seeing a therapist, um, and, and so you know, I had my own mental health, you know, things that I was addressing too as well. And then, and you know, I openly discussed that with others too as well, kind of like tearing down the stigma behind mental health. Um, but um, an interesting phenomenon that I noticed. In myself and in others who who, have, who share similar types of mental health things that I see 
that right away when the when the pandemic hit, there was an overwhelming sense of calm. Um, and I think that one thing, the one way in which one of my friends described it was that, you know, in with the mental health conditions that we deal with, there's this ongoing uncertainty that we're that we're that what we're experiencing is not like the feelings that we're feeling and experiencing it, it is not validated and, and and real. But seeing the global pandemic, it just simply completely validated like, oh yeah, our anxiety is very normal, <laughs> more so than than ever before. Now everyone is feeling this level of anxiety, and then to some extent that was uh, that was validating, and and because like it was understanding that what we're feeling is very normal and, and, and what we're, what we're experiencing is, 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 you know, what other people will be experiencing too as well. So there's a level of certainty that, that what we're seeing is relatively normal. So there's this, this interesting calm the first couple of weeks. And I, and I noticed that pattern in myself and in my friends uh, who, who are in a similar state kind of experienced that too as well. And then uh, after that, it shifted into an ongoing heightened level of anxiety as, as the uncertainty continued on. Um, and I, I, I think that from the mental health component, it's going to have, again, disproportionate impact depending on whether or not people have access to mental health counselors and resources and support systems um, and their ability to, to speak about it and their ability to put words to it. And I think that one thing that um, has been the most powerful thing that I've seen, not just among, for myself, but other individuals who are experiencing mental health crises or need mental health resources, is the fact that they're able to put language to an experience. And the ability to put language to an experience makes it more real. So they can describe it, they can explain it, and they can address it, and they can do something about it. Uh, I, I think that those individuals who have the least amount of access to mental health support systems and resources are the ones who are going to be unable to address these situations, un unable to put words to it. And I think that the ongoing trauma that this is going to cause um, over this, these multiple generations moving forward is going to be long lasting. And I'm afraid about that, you know, and, and I don't know what that's going to look like. And if we take a look at, you know, for example, just our uh, counseling services at UW Eau Claire, you know, we've seen, we haven't seen students not using it we actually have uh, it's my understanding that they've seen increases in the numbers of students who are utilizing counseling services and you know every single time that they add on a temporary like practitioner they're still getting filled you know our student health services is seeing the same type of need in, in, in services too as well um, and so those are some very real tangible things that are happening too as well even amongst our students and so i i i have a feeling that um, one of the main services that's really going to be needed after this is going to be mental health services, really because like what we're experiencing is a collective traumatic experience on a global scale, you know, and, you know, uh, and, and I think to some extent, you know, trauma starts off in shock where, you know, you, you, where you have that sense of calm. And I think that's where a lot of, where my sense of calm came from, a level of shock. And then you start looking at, uh, you know, you, the reality starts to set in and, and that particular piece uh, comes in and then waves of different uh, feelings come through and different ways in which we react to it. Um, and that's, again, you know, I, I don't want to speak on anyone else's behalf and that's just how I myself have been reacting to this and, and the patterns that I've seen amongst our students and patterns that I've seen amongst my friends and my colleagues and my uh, and, and, and my community friends who, who are experiencing similar mental health issues too as well and seeking out mental health services. That's kind of thematically what I've, I've observed myself. Um, and I, we've already had, you know, before the pandemic, um, there has been an ongoing agreement that we don't have enough resources to support a mental health crisis that we are seeing now already. And then this is just going to exacerbate that situation too as well. In a, in, a, in a previous job, before I worked here as the um, director for the Office of Multicultural Affairs, um, you know, I worked at Chippewa Valley Technical College as the director for the Multicultural Other uh, Diversity Resources Office. And that was a very unique department because not only did they serve students of color, but they also served international students, they served students with disabilities, and they also served non-traditional occupation students. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a very wide experience. So working with students with disabilities, I think one of uh, the things that I learned is that um, there has been a precipitous, almost exponential increase in the number of students seeking out 
um, disability services based off of mental health conditions, cognitive behavioral conditions and disabilities that impact their ability to uh, successfully complete school. And even here at UW Quebec too as well, our services for students with disabilities continues to see increases in the number of students who are seeking out visas, which are the accommodation plans for students who have documented disabilities. And those documented disabilities, the fastest growing uh, documented disability that services are being provided for are students with cognitive and behavioral mental health needs. And so, you know, uh, I, I think that those, but that particular um, theme and pattern was already happening pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, we're seeing that there just isn't enough resources to support those individuals right now. Um, and then post-pandemic, I don't know if we're going to have the opportunity and the ability to actually provide the appropriate resources in a timely fashion that the entire nation is going to need. I don't know. I don't know what that's going to look like. And I worry about that too as well. Right. Right. Yeah. The it's like what's going to happen afterwards like it's yeah it's just i mean it's it's so hard to even comprehend right? it is it yeah is. and like how things are going to have to change yeah like to accommodate all of this yeah, so, yeah because because yeah. in when when we experienced 9 11 3, people approximately died uh, over 3,000 people died and we had a national process to mourn. Mm -hmm. We had like years and years to mourn that particular process. And part of the bookend of, uh, of that mourning pr process was rebuilding of the Twin Towers, you know, and then this pandemic within the, within our country alone, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, like how, how many, how many, how many thousands, uh, was it 4 million cases? Oh. Uh, for the United States? Yeah. Oh, so it's, it's um, as of today, it's 1.57 million 1. 5, confirmed million. cases. Yeah, confirmed cases and, and thousands of deaths, you know, mm -hmm. more so than 9-11. You know, what is the grieving process going to look like for that? What is, how are we going to bookend the mourning process um, to come to terms with the situation, the reality that we lost so many lives in this one short amount of time? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry, Abby, I think I interrupted your, your next question or comment. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's gone now, so that's completely fine. I hope yeah. I'm not taking up too much of your time. I, I see that it's oh. about five o'clock. And oh, so I no. want to make sure I'm not, you know. Um, oh, no, no, time. you're all good. I actually just have one last question. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. So knowing what you know now, what do you think that individuals, communities, or governments need to keep in mind for the future? Um, I think, I think the United States has to come to terms with an understanding that first and foremost, we have to be aware that uh, we have a culture of highly individualistic um, traditions, you know, uh, and that permeates through our economic system, it permeates through our social systems, it permeates through our educational systems and so on and so forth. Um, this mentality of um, uh, meritocracy where you're expected to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you yourself alone are responsible for your success and your deficiencies and your failures. I, I think that first of all, we have to be aware that you know, we are a hyper individualistic culture um, and there is some strength to that. Um, and at the same time, we also have to come to terms with there are, that there are some, in addition to the pros associated with that, there are definitely some very significant cons too as well. You know, and I think that um, as government agencies and as individuals in positions that can um, allocate resources and make decisions for the greater good of the country, of the community, of their, uh, of their areas of influence, I think that they have to start taking a more uh, collaborative and collectivistic approach to as well, balancing out that need for individual agency with uh, the collective need of the larger community, larger population. And our policies need to reflect that. Our our systems of support need to reflect that too as well. We can't continue to operate um, in a way where your healthcare is based off of where you work. We can't continue to operate in such a way that uh, you know, like the, the, the viability and success of one business or one company is more important than the livelihood of one or two individuals and, what, and, and their lives. We can't continue to operate in such a way that's, that uh, demonizes one particular population, regardless of what that population happens to be, whether it be like um, 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 
by race, by socioeconomic status, or by class or nationality. Um, and we have to put policies in place. Uh, we have to um, figure out a way to, to better integrate those systems in such a way. We have to find a way to better develop new systems to address those inequities that we have in the country. And I think that um, if we have strong systems that will support people uh, in those capacities and still allow the agency to make individual decisions, you know, then when emergencies like these things happen, uh, global crises, community-wide crises, you know, small scales crises, that those systems will be in place to minimize how far we fall, minimize the amount of uh, negative impact, minimize the amount of deaths, minimize the amount of racism, xenophobia, minimize the amount of, of anti-Semitism, homophobia, sexism, and all those different types of things that's going to uh, be exacerbated by these situations. And, and, and I really hope that you know, those are the outcomes and those are the lessons that we learn from this particular situation. I would hate to go back to normal. Right, right. Yeah, it, this, taking this time and is a learning moment and rebuilding. Yeah. yeah, we need to create a new normal. Right, yeah, no, there's, yeah, as you said earlier, like there's no going back there's to going normal because it, yeah. it wasn't working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Abby, thank you so much for your yeah, time. Thank, yeah, no, thank you so much. You're, uh, like you really brought in a lot of insights that I think are going to be like really helpful when looking back on this. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.